it's an industry to be immensely proud of being part of. I say this as a guy who is outside the industry and, and, and supports it, but yeah, you know, if, if you don't realize this, I, I, I invite, I, I think I'm teaching Granny to suck eggs here, but guys, all of the energy that, that the generation that we have, the, 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 that our civilizations are built upon, we wouldn't have it without your minerals. Yeah, the, the mm. transportation that we have, just about everything that, that I think about as I look around this office yeah. is in some way related to the mining industry. I'm talking to you on this really smart piece of technology. And <laughs> there ain't much yeah. in there that, that didn't come from the mining sector. That's right. You have such a massive and profound impact on our civilization. So thank you. And know that some of us out here are probably more more in awe of what you do than you are yourselves. Greg Sheldon here, your host of Metal Steel Manufacturing and Business Pro Podcast, where you learn everything about the metals and manufacturing industry that make your modern day life possible. Hey, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, welcome, everybody. Today we have Jeffrey Wade and... I have had the pleasure through some connections that I have to have met this gentleman. Um, he is very innovative in, in the way he thinks, and he always puts clients first. And we've been talking about that for 10 minutes now, about, you know, it's not about what somebody's doing in a business. It's not about like when you're communicating with people, it's about the client, but that's mm. not entirely why we're here. We're We're here about that, but we're also here to, talk about metal finder technology but it's also good to get an overview of all the things that jeffrey's involved with and just to get to know the guy because he's a great guy i've talked mm -hmm. to you've we've talked many times right and um yeah. you know it's just been a pleasure every time so i appreciate that and uh and i'm i'm i believe in what he's doing and i'm getting involved with you to help you out right because yeah. i think it's um industry changing uh, is the, what I've put it in my head as. And I mean, this isn't anything new, but it's kind of new coming to, I guess, to the market, suppose. Is that is that fair yeah. to say? It's it's a fair question. Um, I've often asked when I'm talking to new clients who, who get quite interested about um, prospects, if you like, new clients here. Yeah. And, and I say, wow, how come we haven't heard about you? And, and we say, well, um, there's good reasons. There's a small segment of the market, yeah, the, the early adopters, if you like, that, we, that we're relevant to, and then there's other small segments, and we target those. We don't market to the whole world because, because what we do is um, significantly different, if you like, in how we do it, and it's profoundly different in the impact it has on the business of, of, of our clients. So there's a, there's a smaller audience who's who's interested in that. Uh, yeah. there, are, there are folks who are going, mm, you know what, we're, we're doing all right here. We don't need we don't need the the potential disruption that comes with moving to a whole new performance plateau. Mm -hmm. And and the other is that you know some of the some of the work we've been doing, we we have literally been um, doing projects and accumulating data and I, I I'm going to admit that there's a scientist in me. Um, uh, yeah, I believe that absolutely. Yeah, and that's yeah. I, I, okay, yes, there's a science degree way back in the dim dark history, but this the, the principles of science have stuck with me, and that that you know when you when you have a hypothesis, you you then uh, conduct experiments and measure results and gather evidence. Mm -hmm. And with some of the the products, we we have lit and services things that we do. We, we've literally been focused on a modest number of projects at scale where we can accumulate a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And then with the data, we can say, you know what, what we're proposing, uh, well, well, you know, here's here's the the the, the metrics, the measurements that that support it. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, when I think about the mineral finder technology, you know, we've done hundreds of projects with that over the last decade, but a lot of it has been, from from our perspective, we're in that. If you think of Jeffrey Moore, the guy who wrote the marketing book, Crossing the Chasm, where he's talking about how you bring new technology to the market. Mm -hmm. From our perspective, it was very much, we had the technology, knew it worked, but we wanted to have a, uh, um, a targeted market and build enough of a database to show that it worked, but also accumulate 
um, data so that we increase the precision with the, with the product. We've hit that mark. Yeah. We hit that mark in the last year. So now we're going, right, we're, we're happy with where we are with that product. Yeah. Let's get earnest about marketing it because, uh, and, and there, is, there are a couple of little, little bits of R&D still going on with it, but well, yeah. from our perspective, it's rock solid. Yeah. Um, it yeah. has its track record. We we know how it works in all sorts of different terrains and circumstances, and we're really comfortable with um, marketing mm -hmm. it more widely now. And I just want to say, you know, I've learned from you, just this experience with you, because I'm always the type to, like, jump into something and like let's figure it out as we go but looking learning from that has kind of changed my perspective a bit on things you know that you need to learn more on the way through and check out the background of it and, that, and you know, what's the data behind it right so yes so thank you for that um I, and you know we we're okay on the learn as you go um as long as we're the ones taking the risk um if it's learn right. as you go with the customer <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be really frank about them. Hey, well, there's a well, risk that we're sharing here. Uh, and they've, they've got to be open to that. And, you know, that, that's been some of the conversations from the very early days. Uh, when, when, um, yeah. You know, it, 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 it was proven technology before but we, we took it to the first customers, but we're, we, we're pretty transparent with them about this is where we're at. Um, yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, you have a very smaller group of early, early adopters who are prepared to partner with you when you're in that stage. Yeah. Yeah, and then I pass that now, but I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So tell let's get a bit more background, if you don't mind, Jeff. So yeah. it's it's Honoric. That's the name of the company. That's the name of the company. Your yeah. company. Um, you're the CEO founder, which you don't yeah. have on your LinkedIn profile. I want to ask you about that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah. I'm curious. Okay, so let's get into the middle finder eventually, but I'm curious, like what, where did all that come from? Where, what's your history, Jeffrey? Um, so, so talking a little bit about the, the, uh, what, are, what we, the problems we solve, if you will, for, for the clients that we solve from uh, yeah, the starting point, I guess, our history. Um, Look, it, it came out of, uh, the company came into existence when when I decided that um, I'd had a lot of fun in my corporate career, but maybe I didn't fit in, in the last organization I was working with. Right. Um, you know, the, the, the funny story of this, uh, the, the, my, my chairman telling me that I drove the board crazy because um, I kept pushing an incredible rate of change. <laughs> and I decided, okay, <laughs> maybe I don't belong here. And at that time, I'd been doing some, 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 some uh, post post grad studies. I seemed to be a perpetual student, and and they were um, in neuroscience and experts and expertise. But but I, I had a particular interest in how that might apply in a corporate context. Mm -hmm. As a, as a leader in in my corporate career, I'd always understood the the, the importance of the people equation, because while I thought. <clears throat> And the enterprises I worked with were very good at understanding the business domain and, and you know, finance domain and the, and the, the other half dozen things that matter. Um, the, the, <laughs> the technical term is they suck at, <laughs> at understanding the people and, uh, and, and how to work with people in a way that um, is mentally healthy and physically healthy for the people, but also gives you optimum performance and Great customer experience, but it ripples through to drive sustainable improvements in in, uh, in shareholder value. It's it's got a real commercial equation behind it. But I was fascinated and had for a long time been uh, studying the people side of things. And so when I when I uh, resigned from that role, um, I just completed um, some work and I wanted to test it in the corporate space. And we tested it. Uh, yeah, I, I just called around some some CEO friends and said, "I've got this idea. <clears throat> if it works, yeah, you know, pay me. If it doesn't, don't." And uh, I found someone who's ready to give it a go, and I put together a couple of consultants, and we took this stuff in. It it's um, the short story is that it it worked in a way that surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but had the, the CEO of the organization saying we're gobsmacked and using a lot of colorful language to describe the project outcome. <laughs> the sort of thing that's usually marked with a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
it it was it was the way that that CEO she took what had happened and um I've been seeing it in pure um you know people and metrics and scientific you know the cold <laughs> yeah the cool yeah, the cool scientist um but I was kind of thrilled about the the human dimensions and the customer experiences and the and the commercial outcomes Mm-hmm. But uh, but I hadn't really got emotional about it. But she was emotional about it, and she she took the 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 outcome, and you know her her description. You know, she said, "For God's sake, Jeff, we're hawking expletive deleted to people, and they love us." Right? And you took the worst performing business unit in the in the organisation and lifted its performance by nearly three hundred percent in in one hundred and twenty days, and. It's now the best performing business unit by a long way. She said, you, you just, you know, you've got to get your head around what you and your team have done. And um, and that came, I think, from, from our experience with, with understanding, if you like, how people know what they know, do what they do, and how they make change. And um, and so we we started the company doing that sort of thing with organizations. Along the way, you, you you can imagine when I say understanding how people you know know what they do and and and, and how they make change and particularly accelerated change because we have this crazy map of the world. The the change is not hard and slow, right? Right. <laughs> change might have a little bit of complexity to it, and complexity can be broken down into simple components. So we think change is simple. We also think it's lightning fast. Um, and and what do I mean by lightning fast? Uh, you know, we've oh well, you know, I'm going to say some things that your audience will find hard to believe. Um, <laughs> That's all right. We, yeah, but, but, but it, it it'll make the point, I think. And 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 when I for your audience, I'm not plucking these numbers out of the air just to be provocative. These are based on yeah. real experiences, but yeah. it is it is relatively simple to drive a massive culture change in an in, a, in an organization in in weeks right now now people will think that's just crazy now now, now yeah, let yeah. Me really be provocative yeah we've done some engagements where the goal was to change the culture and these are organizations for a thousand people or more and we've changed the culture in 24 to 48 hours Oh, wow, what that's across the just, entire enterprise. That's incredible. Now, the way we go about it is another story, but but and it's like you did what? So people hear these <laughs> things, Jeff, right? They think yeah. they, they hear the same thing. Okay, and then okay, what's the catch yeah. though? Right? Like yeah, that's there's, a, there's, there's no catch. There's just yeah. understanding. There's a, as I said when we were chatting earlier. And you know, I tapped on this and I, I said, I'm not talking about the you know the male patent baldness. Or the the bone, <laughs> squishy gray stuff inside. Yeah, I tap on this and said it's plastic, and I'm not the only one who has neuroplasticity. We have brains that yeah, uh, yeah. that don't seize up when you're 18, and then they're fixed for the rest of your life, as we yeah. used to believe. Yeah, they're plastic lifelong. They learn <laughs> lifelong, and when you know how to work with them. They will shift in significant ways very, very quickly. I think that may be a self-fulfilling prophecy for some people that still believe yeah. that it freezes yeah. at 18, right? Yeah. But um, and, it's and certain... beliefs beliefs will create your reality. That's right. Because because if you think about it, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a playful one here, but if I earnestly believe the world is flat, and some people still do, yeah. Um, I, I could put uh, an individual who who has that belief at a profound level into um, an aircraft uh, or a spacecraft that takes them high enough that they, they can see the curvature of the Earth. I might put them in uh, you know, a, a spaceship and take them far away so that they can see the whole sphere. Mm-hmm. That would be really difficult for, for some of them to process. Their belief, if it's deeply, profoundly held, will delete it'll block and distort the evidence and, and it will say you're no it's fake that's where the in a simulation i'm not off up, 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 i don't believe it you know i won't get in um yeah conspiracies and it's, and... uh yeah yeah it's it, it's 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 a difficult one for human beings to understand that some of their beliefs can be so you know we call them limiting beliefs mm-hmm. because they they prevent new evidence getting in so that they can learn and evolve and develop and improve. 
<laughs> they kind of get stuck. And if you have the belief that's around, hey, that's it, I can't learn anymore. Wow, you know, that, that becomes self-fulfilling. Your, your brain actually looks for evidence to support that mm-hmm. and will drive confirmation bias. And we'll reject behaviors that are that are counterexamples. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Huh. Yes. So, you know, we've got a lot of similarities. We share the same birth date. And yeah, it's funny. Right. It's funny. <laughs> remember? It's funny yeah. that listening to you talk. And I, you know, and that's kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm on my own because mm. um I I didn't fit in either. It was like I yeah. was always like, well, what can we do here? How can we make this better? How can we innovate? And mm. that's where, you know, the stuff that I do now has, has stemmed from. It's more just an extension of me, right? It's just, yeah. how can I be innovative? And so I'm glad I found you because you think the same way. It's, so, well, we're not the only ones. There are, there are a lot of organizations out there. That, you know, I, I think Gallup probably is, is one of the most well-known for saying this. Uh, I mean, I published a book um, um, a long time ago. That I think the title was, well, not think I remember the title, was First Break All the Rules. And among the things that that it said was, in, in simple language, you know, don't recruit square people and try and jam them into a round hole. In other yeah. words, don't, don't recruit someone who's got a bunch of talent and then try and bound them by a position description. Make the position description the flexible thing. Change the shape of it. And when exactly. you get the best out of your people. So, yeah, but with not many organisations have understood what I, I think what Gallup was saying there. Yeah. And... Um, you know, they had a stack of evidence to back that up too. So of course. It's well, a pretty profound observation. Yeah, it is. And it's becoming more of a reality as we have uh, a new, well, my generation, millennials, and then the yeah. generation that's younger than myself. Uh, that becomes more true every day where you can't be bound by these rules that were the norm for you know yeah. a good, good chunk of the industrial uh, age, right? So yeah. So look, I should finish the story because um, you wanted to know how we got to the mineral finder and oil and gas. <laughs> yes, I, yes. I, I, I was saying that we go about things in a different way, and um, it, and it relates to our understanding of um, human beings, their behaviour, uh, and um, some of the different perspectives that have been evolving in recent decades uh, from from the fields of neuroscience and cognitive science, yeah, the psychology too. But um, it, it's it's interesting. Neuroscience and cognitive science is disrupting some of the maps or beliefs that the field of psychology's had for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, psychology seems to be trapped in this map that it's uh, it's very difficult to change and it's slow. Yeah, and um, very much like economics. Part of, my, you know, part of my response to that, if someone says, "All right, smarty pants," you know, well, why is it fast? Uh, the, the the simple response is a lot of the traditional uh, approaches or, or thinking about how you change uh, human behavior or habits is you're making a conscious mind intervention, right? You know, it's like, uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to do X when I used to do Y, right? And then every time you find yourself doing Y, it's, whoa, oh, interrupt. You try and force yourself to do X, yeah, conscious. Um, the dilemma is most of our behavior um, that is habitual is outside conscious awareness. It's automated. And so the, you, you're making, a, if, you, if you will, an intervention at the wrong logical level or in the wrong place. If you want to get, get a behavior change quickly, then how do you interact with the unconscious mind and do the change there? How do you negotiate with the mm-hmm. part of the unconscious mind that's driving the old habit? help it realize that that's not working and then help it make uh, choices to do something new. Now, it, it sounds very fair. It's not. There are processes that do that and they do it fast. They do it in 15, 20 minutes. Yes, man. And people change like that. Well, their brains elect to change and then they just automatically start doing stuff that's different because you're negotiating with the habit, if you will, and the habit's going, oh, okay, it's not serving me. It's not getting the outcome I want. I'm going to shift it. And it commits to drive a new habit. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm simplifying the description a lot, but when you know you know what to do, that that's only one one way of doing it. There are, there are all sorts of other ways. You know, those organizational changes that happen so fast, we, we typically do what we call a metaphorical intervention. And I won't explain that, but it's, it's it's like, whoa, okay, so they're not doing a direct intervention. It's some intervention that involves a metaphor, a story, or a message that's me- embedded in the metaphor is the shift. Okay. And there are some things we do around that, but 
but you get very profound shifts in large groups of people if if, if they get the new metaphor. Can we maybe we could prove that out with the mind, like a, an experiment, a mental experiment of saying within a an organization, a negative um, perception of somebody can change within a day, right? Oh yeah, the the one one of the ones that I'm thinking about that that was uh, the CEO had a habit of murdering the messenger, right? So yes. He wanted people to bring in the bad news so he could fix stuff up, and uh, yeah, or but but, but <laughs> he just on a few too many occasions <laughs> left the messenger's blood on the carpet of his office, so so people stopped. Yeah, and the bad news was getting pushed under the carpet, and um, and by the time it got to him, it was a catastrophe. Yeah, and so so we did some work with him to change his behaviour, and then we did this metaphorical intervention where we would literally call all of the people together. And um, he and his executive team gave them an experience across 10 minutes, which put them into trance. <laughs> but what he did um, gave them the message that he had an open door policy. It involved the doors from his office. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and, um, and the next day, um, someone appeared at, at his office door um, with a degree of trepidation still because they, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they knew the history and they came in and told him some bad news and a problem and that they that they had ideas on how to fix it and you know but but he behaved totally differently and he uh, you know embraced the messenger as it were metaphorically he thanked them for bringing it and he immediately called some of the executives in they worked with the messenger to figure out the strategic response and then they went and did it and he solved the problem the CEO said within an hour of that meeting, the corporate grapevine had changed the culture of the organization. And he said literally over the following weeks, 19 problems that he didn't know about came to the surface and they, they nailed them. And he said that uh, just from that alone, uh, yeah, they were doing other things, but he, he said doing some conservative isolation, it was worth a 9% improvement in profit over the next nine months. Oh, my gosh. It wasn't 9%. It was 8% improvement over the next nine months. Get my numbers right. But, yeah. But, um, so, yeah, That's... The, 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 that sort of thing happens. But, but look, because we go about things in a different way, one of the things that we've understood about accelerated learning is that it involves um, the best way we learn is not the way we're taught. It's through trial and error. Absolutely. And, and in a... Yeah, in a corporate context, that's problematic because, um, you know, an organization is saying, well, okay, if we're going to trial things, we need to manage the risk because, yeah, worst case scenario is we break the company. Mm -hmm. um, another really bad scenario is we'll break a customer's company. Um, yeah, and, and there's, and if you think the mining context, hey, come on, there's an even worst case scenario, um, which is, you know, people's lives can be lost. Yeah, uh, the one thing you have to respect about mine is they do understand the the high risk nature of the environments that they work in, and they're very they're very risk averse. A solid reasons, um, mm -hmm. and I, and I like I respect the way they assess risk and hazard and manage that, not just physically on the site, but in their business. So um, we we. We um, we we had uh, games or virtual world simulations that that we would build for clients, and some of them are generic, and some are specific. You know, digital twin, a complete mimic of their business. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, just just accept without me getting into a lot of detail. It's a very sophisticated model. It includes all the business rules that the, the sim can connect to their ERP and all sorts of stuff. It's you jump into the sim, <clears throat> it's like playing in the real world. Yeah. And um, and we put people in the sims, and, and there they could try the new ideas. They could rehearse new ideas, yes. and they could they could fail because the cost is virtual, but the learning was real. And and what yeah, you know, what a big deal! Yes, it is a big deal because <laughs> in, in four hours in a in a sim with time slightly accelerated, we we could measure that people were were getting the equivalent of four years or more real world experience learning. That's awesome. There's a, there's a thing called a Dreyfus scale, and um, there, there are other other ways to measure that. Mm -hmm. um, so you could see these massive uh, skill shifts um, from you know, novice to master. Um, but but we could also use those things for clients who had wicked problems and they wanted to figure out how to solve them. So they put teams of people into the sim, and they 
try their ideas and fail miserably <laughs> on lots of them, but then they'd find one that works and, and then rehearse the life out of it and bring it back to the real world yeah. and deploy it very, very quickly because they'd practiced in the sim. Exactly. So, okay, we're building it, sims. So how's this getting there, Jeff? Well, we built sims for mining companies, didn't we? And what's the stumbling block that we hit? Um, oh, my God, the paucity of information. Sorry, miners. <laughs> There's a massive sense of empathy here. A lot of you, you know, you're mining these these ore bodies and you've got bigger all information about them. Now, that might be okay if you're, if, if you're mining, um, you know, an, an ore body of iron ore that's... <laughs> 70 or 80 percent iron and it's, it's it's 20 square kilometers of this great chunk of red stuff sitting in the ground but for others where where you're wanting to to actually know where to mine because it's economical and where to avoid because it's not and 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 you're wanting to mine in a way that gets you a consistent grade coming to the processing mm -hmm. plant because the mm -hmm. processing plant you know operates in a very narrow window of grade mm -hmm. um it, it was like, wow, you know, we're trying to help these guys run the mine better. But we, we just kept thinking they could have so much more information about the ore body that would help them pay in the mining um, in, in superior ways. So we went on the hunt um, purely to find ways to get more information into the sims that we were building. Wow. And we, we came across this, this company, SeaTac, um, our partners. Um, they're, they're, they're out of Bogota in Colombia and they had this brilliant technology that it just, I mean, it's disruptive and it, and it was like, wow, some people don't know about it and it's because to some extent of what I was saying before, they were targeting um, mm -hmm. the early adopters and they were, they were just honing their skills even though they had something that was brilliant to begin with and, and every project they've done has been a success. Mm -hmm. It's um, and, the, and the tech it actually was originally developed for oil and gas, for offshore and onshore. And um, it's it's interesting because it it just gives so much more information and accurate information um, so on, on what's, what's undercover. Yeah, and, Jeff, and it, it, yeah. And Jeff. So we put that in the virtual worlds, but then we said to these guys, love what you're doing. Don't like the way you're marketing it. Can we be... Can we work with you? <laughs> yeah, can we be your partner? Can you, yeah, yeah. And, all that and stuff. just over over time, as as we got to know one another, um, we we formulated that relationship. Yeah. And so and now we we um, we partner with them. We represent them. Um, we're we're seriously taking it to market. Well, no kidding. I mean, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And I'm I'm nobody to explain it because I'm still learning. Yeah. Um, but I would love to get the basic overview of kind of how it works yeah, sure. without giving away anything right that is no, it's not like we can give away as much as we can within reason um yeah that's what i mean so the 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 technology the miners uh who, who hear this shouldn't shouldn't be surprised that, that they're going to recognize it where i say okay it's it's magnetics or electromagnetic and they go oh yeah yeah we've seen that yes you have there's all forms of electromagnetic. I mean, they've got their seismic and gravimetric. There's 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 loads of ways to explore, and there's there's uh, you know there's ground penetrating um, radar and um, uh, at different wavelengths. The dilemma with uh, a lot of the the what, what what I would call active technology that miners use is the deeper you go, the more the signals disperse and. Um, the the less accuracy you get so that's problem because you know, they, they take their data and they see there's something there and they go right well we're going to drill here and and because the the information they've got is not sufficiently precise at depth they might miss their target by 20 meters and they mm. go all oh, right well <laughs> A big deal until you figure out how much an offshore well costs, you know, and, and they're, you know, 35, 50 million, some of them. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap to drill a hole. And even onshore, you know, um, a hole with depth can cost you a million bucks. So, <clears throat> so the, the, that's, the, the, there's, there's a lot of good technology that miners use and will continue to use, but I, I, I see that it's just not giving them the, the, um, 
the accuracy they want, which is what leads to those statistics. You know, I describe the exploration model for mining as, as god awful. Um, and it's, I'm being a little provocative. The miners, are, their, their, their attitude is, no, it's what, we, it's what we've always had. We have to live with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I hear that. But it's like, you know, god awful is, is something that takes a long time. Three, five years. You know, I've got one client who's, who's just finishing a piece of exploration that's gone on for 24 years. Oh, my but, gosh. Yeah, and it's and and they're you know that they've finally discovered what you know would be described as bonanza in terms of um, you know a, a, a gold reserve. All that time to get there, yeah. The cost of the time, you know, if they've been mining twenty years ago, holy left and that would have been produced. So t- the time thing, yeah, you know, drives me crazy, and I know it drives them crazy. Um, the the cost, it's really expensive to to do that, but. But what is ugly with that is the success rate. It's, it's you know, it, it, some people say it's one in ten, some one in twenty. It's kind of in that five to ten percent range, and so there's the, these big time investments, big capital expense, um, and and low success rate. Mm. And then you know, you've got your environmental complications and several other things, and you also wind up with not much data because it's so expensive to drill the holes. That you got a bit of accurate data where you've drilled the holes, and then you know the rest is from all the other forms of uh, um, survey that you've done, and you attempt to integrate that data. Mm-hmm. Um, the the way the 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 oil and gas finder and mineral uh, technology goes about it that's different is number one, it's passive. Now, that's a big thing to get your head around, right? Um, what does that mean? Passive is, is measuring changes in the Earth's magnetic field. And again, the miners should be leaning back saying, this is nothing new, Jeff. <laughs> Heard this one before, right? Yeah. Good at okay. saying that. The difference is we're looking at distortions in the Earth's magnetic field at the resonant frequency of the mineral or, you know, the oil, the gas, the condensate, whatever. <laughs> uh, in the deep blue and ultraviolet spectrum. Now that should have some of the miners sit up and take notice. It's like, hang on a second, Jeff, that's totally different end to the spectrum where mostly we're operating. Mostly it's in the microwave, uh, you know, the infrared, the other, and and much longer wavelength. When when the the spectrum that we're looking at, you know, the wavelengths you're measuring are sort of 50 to maybe three, 400 nanometers. Mm -hmm. They're tiny, tiny, tiny. Which which means you're... you're, um, your precision shifts, even with you know the, the, the some of the things that happen um, uh, as as uh, you know electromagnetic signals move through the crust of the Earth, um, mm-hmm. the wavelengths are so small that you're still retaining accuracy. So that uh, I, I think they understand that sort of those electromagnetic physics and the geophysics enough. I hope to sit up and take notice and go, okay, yeah. Number one, the wavelengths are different, so the accuracy is going to be higher. Yep. Number two, hey, hang on, no one else is doing that. Damn right, no one else is doing it. We're not <laughs> looking at the resonant frequencies of the minerals because that information is not published, by the way. It's proprietary to the company. They've done all the research to find yeah. those resonant frequencies. And, and yeah, we're, and, and it also, you know, it will look at things like, you know, diamonds and emeralds and gems, not just metalliferous. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, so that's the first thing. And um, and, and it's, a, it's a multi-stage process, typically... <clears throat> What we do in in phase one, uh, so three phases, and then a, a, a um, if you like a remote phase, a field phase, and then in the lab where the AI and neural net software is doing all of the uh, you know, excuse me, pattern recognition and pulling the data from the multiple sources together and making a three D map. Mm-hmm. Um, so phase one, typically we're grabbing satellite data and we're looking at a big area. And we're looking to see in that big area, is there something there? And 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 most of the time, um, and, and when we're looking at that area, by the way, straight away we're looking underground. We're not looking for surface evidence. Yeah. Because of the way we're doing it, we're seeing underground. Yeah. How deep, Jeff? Um, 9.8 kilometers, round it to 10 if you like. Which, okay. which is, you know, okay, that's that's dandy, but who minds that deep? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, I kind of, yeah, we can see long way, way, way yeah. further than most people can mine yeah. it. Oh, which, there you go. Okay. Which is kind of, you know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, well, what well, was that worth? 
it, it's deep enough as the answer for most miners would would, would give you. It's okay. It's like, yeah, the mark the areas for the future. Purposes. Yeah, they don't need to see that far. Um, and, and and so what what comes out of that is an appreciation that you know maybe we've looked at yeah you know, hundred square kilometers. I mean there've been times where we've been asked to look at you know two hundred thousand square kilometers, and and in that area there you go no. <laughs> The, 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 there's evidence of these specific minerals um, in these places, and then uh, the, the client decides whether they want to go back and do phase two, which is the field work where we get a lot more accuracy. Mm -hmm. And the field work we get on the ground, and there's two different places there where uh, we're taking much more precise measurements, but still, uh, um, and it's, it's uh, yeah, we call it FSPEF um, is, is one, you know, um, and and the ZERS, which is both, you know, their acronyms, the miners, or the, certainly the geophysicists would recognise. Yeah. And, and again, looking at the resonant frequency of the mineral of interest, um, and so you know, FSP forming short forming pulse. short pulse electromagnetic yeah, exactly. fields. Yeah. ZERS is the vertical electromagnetic sounding. Resonance. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, what what we do is, of course, take a lot more sample points and um, and get very precise. Uh, indications of what's there and where it is and then we we go back to the lab and um and integrate all that data and they wind up with um a map that will have at the low end fifteen thousand, but more typically maybe fifty thousand data points oh my gosh and, and yeah and a, and a three-dimensional picture of what's there we can also see the water we can see the you know the geology so we can show them the you know the, the yeah fault lines and <clears throat> all that sort of stuff. The water I just skipped over, but the miners tend to get excited about that because of it's, you know, but usually it's <clears throat> it's something they don't want to mess with. Right. Yeah, it, it can be inconvenient to to not so they so stuff. they want to stay away from that. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, because you've you, you've got in some places you do literally have underground flows. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you, you're busy, you know, um, drilling away. You didn't know it's there. Now, now you got a water problem. However, if we could, if you could utilize that, if somebody was looking for water, and let's say, oh yeah, you could, there's the water water we're... finder technology version. We we call it oil and gas finder, which which goes about it in a slightly different way. The mineral finder and mm -hmm. the water finder, but um, yeah, and it's look, you know, one of the things that I've skipped over there. The oil and gas gas guys get excited because um, it also tells them the pressure, oh, which is interesting. Good. Yeah, so it's like, hey, that's what's there, and you know, and, hey, there's, there's, and, and they're getting a three dimensional view of it, and you know, they're, they're, there's your oil, there's your gas, you know, there's the water, you know, the salt, the condensate, whatever, and um, but it's, you know, it's it's been interesting with with the oil and gas finder technology. We've come in on a number of projects where they've done some um, some work already. You would expect they've done some seismic, and they have. Mm -hmm. They may have even drilled. And you know, I'm, I'm thinking of one where they'd um, they'd they drilled and hit one dry well because their their data wasn't accurate enough. They drilled and found yeah, there really was gas and, and um, uh, stuff there. But their their data was telling them there were the indications that there might be oil as well. So which so we came in and did the mineral finder tech for them over a period of twelve weeks. It only takes that long. That's the other thing, speed. Yeah. Um, and for a, from from their perspective, the, the investment's small. You know, as they said this is less than one percent of our budget. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> less than one percent of our budget to move from you know, say twenty percent confidence about our data to yeah ninety eight percent. You know, the accuracy sort of sits in that 98 percent range. Yeah. So um, we we gave them a, a new map that showed them they missed a couple of gas bodies, and why they had a dry well because. The data wasn't quite pre precise, but we also showed them that there was oil underneath, and that they, because we could see deeper, um, so so they they drilled another hole and they found the oil. <laughs> That's and, awesome. Uh, and the, and yeah, as, as they said, the time saving they thought would on that was probably three years. And wow. then the exploration, the exploration saving they they thought was a uh, somewhere in the eight to ten million range on, on that project because they would have drilled a number of extra wells before they eventually found what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, we've we've had other ones. Uh, that was an onshore one. We've had offshore ones, same thing. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> had done some work, had drilled one well that was successful and one that was dry, and so they wanted more data before they drilled anymore. And, and I was just, you know, we did, did our, um, the analysis for the mineral, uh, the oil and gas finder tech, and it was like, you could literally see on the map we gave them why they had a dry well. They missed it by 100 metres, that was all. Their data wasn't, you know, they were so close. Yeah. That's... Gone down was beside it. <clears throat> wow. So, so uh, yeah, it's... Well... it's very amazing like and i've looked through the case studies and i've looked through i mean it's yeah. impressive i can't talk about that because that's confidential but well, the, I, if there's the, anybody if anybody because there's always this mindset of like oh well we maybe yeah. we could do that ourselves or we could go develop this ourselves i'm curious you know for, you could. well you could but what yeah. what is what is the barrier we'll talk to you in 10 years <laughs> <laughs> there you go okay yeah. Like, yeah 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 that that's a good and it's, yeah what's the cost of the 10-year play but as, as as we say it's a bit of a it's a bit of a game changer because you know i i started by saying i really have compassion for for the miners that what i call the god awful model long time high expense low success rate um just not a nice equation we wheel in and we say, hey, you know, <laughs> we think we're smart. <laughs> we've got something that's quick. It takes 12 weeks. Hey, it's not expensive. You know, it's, it's uh, we can cut your exploration costs by at least 80%. And by the way, it's it's very accurate. And also, oh, it's environmentally friendly. You don't have to get all these permits that take three years. You know, you're not, you're not going to tick off the, um, <clears throat> uh, oh, gosh, mental blank, but the, the, uh, the environmental folks who are worried about you uh, well, yeah, yeah. drilling holes and disrupting complex uh, geology, not going to upset the folks who are worried about the um, you know, mammalian life form, the whales and the dolphins and the yeah. uh, you know, the turtles who could be disturbed by your seismic experiments. So um, huh. marine biologists was the word I was looking for. There it is. Yeah, it's it, so, it does make life... It does I, make life a little bit easier for them. And, and you know, you, you put it together with the stuff you've already got. I mean, you can use it on its own. I mean, we've had clients have just done the mineral finder tech, drilled their, their 10 holes or five holes to verify, um, and, and, and and then just gone to market and sold the tenement for a hefty profit and moved on to the next one. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Some of the business models people have come up with is pretty brilliant. I'm curious about what are some of the biggest, maybe the biggest, what's the objections you hear? Maybe we could answer them today. Yeah. Um, you, you get the geo, uh, the geophysics or the, or the just, just the plain physics objections. It's like, you know, how can it be accurate? Um, yeah. And, and I hear that it's, it's the stuff where they're, they're typically coming from the perspective of the, what I call the active technology. And and it does have its accuracy uh, limitations, but but we're we're going about it a very different way. It's passive, yeah. and it's a different you know, these nanometer wavelengths, so that even even if you, you, your accuracy disperses you know, a thousand times, yeah. But compared still to still talking about accuracy, there's more than enough to drill exactly where you want. But compared to the old way, I mean, it's yeah. light years, right? Yeah, yeah. It it, it it's it's. It's light years in terms of the accuracy. Yeah. 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 Um, we we do get, as I said, the GF is one of what um, usually they want to understand. Actually, the senior execs, they go, okay, I, I want to see the case studies. You know, I manage my risk that way. I'm sure we can, you know, non disclosure agreement. We've got some of course. Who, yeah. Who've given us permission to share their, their 100, 200 page reports. And then we've got other clients who have given us per permission to talk, you know, the one paragraph of, about what they've done. And we've got the list of mm -hmm. projects that have been done. So that, that they're just, okay, there's a track record. And if they see anyone on the list, they know. I pick up the phone and talk to them, or we can arrange that. But 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 the yeah. the um yeah, the geologists, the geophysicists, they really want to understand the technology. And so what we do is we we set aside time with them and we take them through that. And um, it can be up to a two-hour exercise <laughs> where we literally take them through in nitty-gritty detail, um, you know, what, what's going on in each phase. And we talk about the equipment we're using. Because, again, you know, um, 
you know, I just skipped over it. I haven't said that in, in, in those field phases, there's, again, two pieces of um, yeah, proprietary equipment that, that, that we use that um, we're, we're built specifically for this. But I haven't said that there's proprietary stuff that's in, in the lab when we're, we're processing the, <clears throat> mm -hmm. the data from the satellites. So, yeah, there's, there's, there is a lot more to it. But we, we take the, uh, the geologists and geophysicists through that. And when they have enough detail to understand each step and how it's working and what's going on, Mm -hmm. They usually go back to the execs and say, right, technically it stacks up. Um, and so from their perspective, again, because the the expenditure is modest um, in exploration terms, you know, it's typically <clears throat> so under two million US dollars. Um, and uh, the, then, you know, it depends upon the area and the number of minerals you're looking for. Uh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if any of the geologists will relate to this one, but I remember yeah, I was talking to one and we said, all right, yeah, what, what, what minerals do you want us to look for? Because, <clears throat> you know, it just expands the scope of the work. And he came straight back and said, the entire periodic table. <laughs> 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 yeah. And then he laughed and he said, that's what we geologists want. <laughs> yeah, the, the periodic table. And he said, no, actually, for this tenement, you know, we're looking for you know, golden platinoids. And so, so we look for half a dozen different things but <clears throat> it's um yeah the size of the area and the number of minerals you're looking for can it can impact the, the investment but um yeah it's typically you know in their terms it's low cost and uh it's um that they'll look typically they'll, they'll look in their portfolio at a tenement where they've got say complex geology or not enough information where they've got a problem and they'll, and they'll say, help us here. Mm -hmm. Do that as a trial. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll go in and we, we we have a look at what's going on. You know, and, I, and I, you know, I'm thinking of one that, that it, was, it was kind of a funny story, but it's not the only one. And so some of the, the miners who've been around for a while will appreciate this. Uh, it was a big copper mine and um, they'd been running for decades. And they were reaching the edge of what they knew about um, the ore body, but they also knew that it was a lot bigger. So we were brought in to do brownfield, if you like, but just to, to give them data on the the, the, the greater expense of the, the copper ore body. Mm -hmm. And we did that, which they were very pleased with, but because we were looking at um, uh, the, 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 the whole mine operation, basically, we... we, we Got all this data on their um, on their tailings, and and we said, you know, you realise there are six different forms of copper in your ore body, but you're not processing for all of them. So there's more there's more copper sitting in your tailings than there are in the. <laughs> you can literally stop mining and just reprocess the tailings. There's billions sitting there. Um, oh my god, that's not uncommon. Um, you know, we've had gold mines where, you know, they're, they're, they've just been processing for the gold and, and missed that there were other very precious metals sitting there in their tailings that um, they could reprocess for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amazing, man. You, you, get, you do get funny stories. It would be, absolutely. Yeah. It's so interesting. Yeah. I uh, and the field, yeah, because the field work takes you to odd places. Yeah, yeah, you, you know what mining is like. Uh, you know, it's it's usually in the back of nowhere, as we say. Yeah, some remote. Yeah, um, and rough terrain with a hideous climate. But um, and and again, the field work is 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 interesting for us because our kit, uh, you know, the heaviest one is is about five to six kilos. Most of it's little little you know, field kit. Oh, that's perfect. So, yeah, so. Yeah, it's literally put it in their pocket, or you know, it's it's very transportable in rough terrain. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, and, and yes, you can put it in vehicles and <clears throat> boats and stuff like that. Very cool, very cool. Um, so there's no permits or licenses. This you can do this thing anywhere based on yeah. you know, the, a lot of these clients have given you their worst case <laughs> here do they this do, they <laughs> do, and with the, we do the pilot with them and then it's uh yeah there's one going on now where there's a where there's a pilot and the client 
that, that they're a bigger mind and they just said we we're doing the pilot everything looks right but we want to know <laughs> yeah um, and we'll know when we see it on our raw uh, body and, and compare what you do with what data we have. But um, if it yeah. works as we think it will, then straight away there's eight other things we want you to look at. That's typically <laughs> the way it works. And what, one of the things we are trying to do is um, set up a um, a project where. Uh, and, and it's, it, yeah, you, know, you can understand, and the miners will appreciate that this is a tricky one where we would uh, explore a tenement for them and um, we'd pull in some, you know, postgraduate students and have them, if you like, do the peer-reviewed paper on it, um, which which sounds great until you realise, hey, hang on a second, what's in that tenement is is commercially sensitive information, it's proprietary stuff and the yeah, if they're a publicly traded company, it's um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's the sort of thing you have to be careful with. So, so that's why I said we every every time that we we ask, um, can we do a case study? It's usually teams of lawyers on both sides <laughs> redacting stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Before we get permission to talk about it, which is okay. Um, you know, of course, respect our clients' needs, but that's that's just the real world you live in with with. Uh, with exploring. business, yeah, and exploring and yes, and minerals, yeah. lawyers, yeah. lawyers are always well, uh, well, well, it, it's commercially sensitive information. Well, that's right, and you have to really you have to protect yeah. people. That's right. Yeah, you got to protect your client. Yeah. Well, we think that one of these days we will find someone. Uh, in, in fact, we're talking with some folks at the moment who will approve uh, an exercise like that, and I think that'll be the last piece of the puzzle for those skeptical physicists and geophysicists and geologists. Oh. If, if we've had a team of um, <clears throat> uh, a miners, say from Colorado School of Mines or, or some other you know, equally reputable um, school of mining, um, mm -hmm. come along and do the project in parallel with us, um, yeah, and, and light it up, yeah, that would help. Very cool. Well, there you go, folks. <clears throat> Exciting stuff. I uh, I cannot wait to. I've got some family relations that uh, we're going to talk to um, and then some other people too. So um, I thank you, Jeff, for your time. To your audience, thanks for listening. And I hope that they, um, they're they skeptical but curious. Oh, that's the main thing, man. It's just yeah. I want them to ask more questions, right? And yeah. yeah. We're all... if, if they're not skeptical, I get worried. I, I give them a hard time. But it's and it's and, and you can kind of laugh at that, but it's it's like, well, come on, think about it. There's that triangle that we're all familiar with: time, quality, cost. Mm -hmm. And the rule is, you can have two points of the triangle, but not three. You, you can. get two; it's at the cost, it's expense of the other. I've just said I've got something that gives you all three points of the triangle. Yeah. Straight away, you should sit up and go, "Hang on, that's a rule breaker." Well, and that's it. We're all yeah, it taught is. from a young age. We're all taught if it's too good to be true, yeah. then it probably yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I'd, I'd expect that. And if you've got that healthy skepticism, that's fantastic because that means you'll 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 do a proper evaluation, mm -hmm. and and you'll you'll come out with a, a an understanding of, of whether it's useful for you or not. Absolutely. It's a yeah. It's it's a genuine disruptor. It's a game changer. I'm excited about it because. I, I look at it in terms of, you know, we work with mining for a long time and that, that industry gets a bad rap that I don't think it deserves. They've done some silly things in the past. But well, like, they have, and that and that's the funny it's thing. A bunch of people. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a bunch of people. Just, it's, they're people, yeah. absolutely. It's an industry yeah. that has people in it and they get labeled as this yeah. bad thing. But well, I think yeah. this can help progress that because it's... Yeah, I think so. it, it's green in a lot of ways. It's not disruptive yeah, it to is. the environment. It's green because you don't yeah. have the, as much of a carbon footprint. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's the biggest pitch, in my opinion. Um, yeah. But there's so many others too. Cost. You got to be yeah. profitable as a business. Yeah. Well, the time one. The time one has the greatest value for them, and that's that's where I think it's the, the time is right for this, and for miners to look at it because <clears throat> you mentioned environmental. And we, we we do seem as a as a, a series of nations and economies to be committed to changing the way we generate energy. 
Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we're moving and, and um, the, we, we're changing the way we fuel transport in particular. We're moving to, to electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles and maybe uh, gas vehicles as well. But um, certainly that shift to, to electrical driven transportation means there's a demand that's coming in the next decade. Oh, that's great. Years. That far exceeds the the mining industry's capacity to expand their production. Mm -hmm. they, they've got to get the minerals are there, but we, we've got to get we've got to discover them and get more mines into production with those rare earths for the batteries, the copper for crying out loud, just for the electric motors. Well, um, there's got to be a massive scaling, and that means they have to discover things more quickly, mm -hmm. way more quickly. They can't afford the five to seven year um, uh, exploration phase. That they can discover it quickly, they can value it, they can find it, and then they can get the mine of production more quickly. And that's where um, we can bring real value to them. Uh, and um, that's and what I'm excited about. I'm excited about that, but also this kind of changes the game for a lot of the unethical things that are happening in lithium and cobalt mining, oh, yeah, you know, across the globe. Um, yeah, you know, We're talking about some of the stuff going on in Africa, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's just awful. And I think this can at least get us in a direction of the right place because, yeah, yeah the demand is huge. And the demand is huge and the miners are heading in the right direction. I think Mark Kudafani, uh, he's the, the, most of the miners will know this, he's the ex-CEO. He retired in April, May last year of Anglo-American. And I remember him saying, um, you know, the mining industry um, – doesn't do too well on the trust index. You know, uh, at, at the bottom is, you know, political and government, and then the next tier up. <laughs> and it's, I think he said something, you know, it's not the place you want to be. Well, certainly, you know, you, you don't want to be next to the politi politicians. Mm. But he said we're committed to moving our way up. And, you know, and he talked about the things that the mining industry is doing. And it, it's, it's not just, he wasn't talking just about Anglo. He talked about what Anglo is doing, which was, which is good, but then you know he, he gave examples of what some of the other uh, companies are committed to, and and they're they're on that path, and so I, I see them lifting their their position to to become more trusted organisations. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. There will always be some some. Um, I, I'm just say questionable operators. Um, yeah. But but the the, the corporations um, no right they they seem to be committed to safe productive environmentally responsible mining zero carbon footprint and they they're well on the path mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah absolutely I think some of the the mandates by governments is a little crazy by twenty thirty for some of this stuff but yeah. it doesn't mean we can we can't make progress which we are making so. Yeah. So the, your AR VR stuff as well plays into that, and it, and it shows it that that an industry's progressive, right? And and it's yeah. changing, and I think just the numbers speak for themselves, right? So the the, the application for the AR stuff in the mining has mostly been um, we'll, we'll build a, a sim of, of a of a, um, a particular asset. Um, and it can be, uh, you know, from from the exploration phase where they go into the the simulation and they can plan, they can design different variations of the mine and then see how it runs. Mm -hmm. And and then uh, you know throughout the life of the mine they can use the sim for orientation training for rehearsing new ideas for de rehearsing deployment of new technology. It just you know goes on and on and on. But um, mm -hmm. uh, and and. Certainly, we've had mines who've used those sorts of sims, operating mines, to figure out how to double their productivity or their throughput with with um, you know, minimal change, minimal it's, expense, and they've oh. had those sorts of outcomes. Which is, you know, from a mining perspective, that's crazy. That's so yeah. awesome, man! Like, think yeah. about that. Think about that in like thirty or forty or fifty years, yeah. when the people that have seen twice as many or four times as many yeah. simulations. Then they're advising that next generation, and then it just keeps perpetuating, right? Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. and assume you know you think I was saying the dilemma they've got is speed. <laughs> How can they discover stuff more quickly? How can they get the mine up and running more quickly once they've got it running? Um, yeah, keeping it optimal and safe. 
and, and certainly we use the sims for safety because you know you put people in the, in, in the simulation you can throw curveballs at them and they you know they wind up dead in the simulation let me tell you <laughs> that's a profound learning experience I've so we, we've I've seen that you know 25 year veteran miners sitting there shaking and, and sheet white because they realized that what they thought to do was was the wrong thing mm -hmm. and they've died in the simulation and uh, it, it profoundly reprograms the gray matter and okay. they go back to the to the mind and they behave differently because when they're in the sim it's so real that the brain forgets that it's in a simulation after a few minutes so what they learn in the sim maps to reality um yeah we, we've seen massive improvements in safety um I, again ca can talk about it in limited fashion but the uh, one of the the global multinational um, mining corporations did a project where there was this huge shift in safety you know, in terms of recognizing the hazards, time to respond, nature of response, that sort of stuff. So, um, all sorts of shifts in the in the, in the right way and and a change in culture and habit that came out of that. But uh, yeah, it's the, the sims have interesting application, and um, yeah, you can even use it for um, rehearsing. As I said, well, skill development. We've we've got one that was, has been built for um, building the the leadership skills of your mind general managers. That's awesome. I, I talked about that one. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. You know, well, and the sales I, too. That was yeah. First client using that is pretty excited about it. But um, yeah, they, 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 they said they've got great technical people. They've got these GMs who are good geologists or whatever. Um, you know, civil engineers, et cetera, but, but they, they put them in leadership roles and they haven't necessarily built the business domain expertise or the, the people leadership stuff. Um, and and what, what happens is they burn them out after 18 months and they lose good people and then they lose people below them as well because they've had a crappy experience. Mm -hmm. And so we're using the simulation to plug those gaps to get them the business domain expertise. And so, yeah, you go into the sim, it's a stressed asset, you got a crap relationship with, uh, sorry, technical language. You've got a poor relationship <laughs> with the community <laughs> and, and they've got to solve the problem. And, it, and it's either wind up the mine or figure out how to turn it around and make it profitable. Yeah. And it's uh, it's a steep learning curve for these guys, but it, uh, it then translates back to how they run their own minds. Yeah, man. Mm. All right, Jeff. Well, thank you so much. Likewise. It's been awesome. And, um, Honoric is the name of the company, correct? And where do people find that? Uh, Honoric.com.au, just O N I R I K. That's it. O N I R I K.com.au. Um, you, you can find us on the web and a little bit about what we've been talking about. Yeah. And certainly, we, while we're, you know, I'm based here in Australia, we've got team all around the world. So, um, yeah, re reach out to us. If you want a conversation, um, we're, we're as curious and uh, as, as inquisitive as anybody else. You're not going to get a hard sales pitch. We um, we know that there are certain clients that we can help, and we look for those. We look for the right match. We're, we're not about selling um, you know, units. Ice, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're looking yeah. right for the folks who live in the uh, tropics. Who I, could, the rice. <laughs> I could tell that from the very beginning. You know, it was wasn't about pitching a, a unit. Yep. It's about so if, bigger than that, right? Yeah. It's, can we can we help you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure. In that case, go talk to Fred that I know <laughs> my professional network because Fred has got what you want. Um, and, yeah. Uh, and if we can help you, yeah, I think we can. All right, then let's talk about how we do it in a low risk way. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Any parting advice for anybody in the industry? Parting advice for anyone in the industry. Mining industry, that is. Yeah, I know, I know, I know what you meant. I think it, it, it loops back to um, it loops back to what I was saying um, when I was quoting Mark Kudafani. Um, take a hell of a lot more pride in what you do than than some of the social media and crap that goes around. Um, yeah, it's. It's an industry to be immensely proud of being part of. I say this as a guy who's outside the industry and, and, and supports it, but you know, if, if you don't realize this, I, I, I invite, I, I think I'm teaching granny to suck eggs here, but guys, 
all of the energy that, that the generation that we have the, 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 that our civilizations are built upon we wouldn't have it without your minerals yeah the the mm. transportation that we have just about everything that, that i think about as i look around this office yeah. is in some way related to the mining industry i'm talking to you on this really smart piece of technology and <laughs> There ain't much because, in there that, that didn't come from the mining sector. That's right. You have such a massive and profound impact on our civilization. So thank you. And know that some of us out here are probably more more all in awe of what you do than you are yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Keep, keep the uh yeah, keep the pride in what you're doing, keep the integrity that you've got that you don't get credit for. Wow. Well, that is the first time we've had a thank you. Jeff and I, they're appreciative. I know it. So I hope so. They, they've earned it. It's it's a high risk. You know, the, the, I said that at the beginning. You know, the, the the context in which I deliver that message is I know the work. You know, I've been to to the mines. I've, I've been to the places that you you guys and girls work. It's it, usually in the middle of nowhere. It's usually high risk. It's usually an unpleasant climate. Yeah. And you're doing stuff that's the backbone of of my daily life. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Mm. Absolutely. All right, Jeffrey, thank you so much. We'll thank talk you. to you soon. Amen. Cheers. All right, have a good day. You too. Okay. Greg Sheldon here, your host of Metal Steel Manufacturing and Business Pro Podcast, where you learn everything about the metals and manufacturing industry that make your modern day life possible.